Yeah, well, I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, so, thank you for coming today. I just want to say, as I go through each one of these slides, if you have a cell phone and you want to take a picture of any of the slides, please do. You'll see on some slides, I have this little blue um, dot with a camera in it. I would love for you to take a picture of that slide so you can have this, whatever information's on that slide as a resource so you don't have to keep it in here. You can just have it on your, in your palm. So definitely feel free to use your cell phones. Also, um, if you wanna connect with me, take a picture. Um, I have a podcast called Projects for Wildlife and I'm on Instagram and Facebook, so I'd love for you to tag me and for us to connect in social media. And um, yeah, so that's kind of just to feel very comfortable in here. And if you have questions, we can answer them all at the end. So hello, come on in, take a seat. Um, and I'll answer them at the end of this, and so I'm just really excited to connect with you, and so write down anything you have that you might wanna ask at the end. Okay, so raise your hand if this applies to you. You own a drone. Okay, two people in here. You have an idea of maybe photographing or videoing with a drone. You wanna do some research with a drone. <laughs> maybe, okay, so we have a couple of people here. Or how many of you have just been out birding or on a nature trail and experienced a drone overhead? And then how many of you have had a drone fly over your backyard or through your neighborhood? Okay, so as you can see, there's lots of ways and lots of places that drones are infiltrating where we live, where we hike, and the places that we are going. And there's a lot of ideas of like how to use these drones. And so today, what I'm going to talk about is disturbances to wildlife. So you might think I'm going to tell you not to fly a drone. I'm not going to tell you that, but I, am, I do want you to feel empowered to have conversations outside of this room. So if you do see a drone pilot, you can approach them in a way that's going to be a positive way to talk to them about what they're doing. Hello, would you like to come in? Um, <laughs> welcome all. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways you can you can um, talk to people positively, and then also some ideas that you can integrate into your drone flights if you decide you want to become a drone pilot and start to use this as a tool. So let's keep going. So how many of you have actually gotten to the point with a drone. So there's a few of you that raised your hands and said that you were thinking about using the drone, that you're actually using the drone to conduct research or videography right now. Like how many are actually doing work? Okay, awesome. So I'm hoping by the end of this conversation today that you can really take this, the six tips that I'm gonna share with you into your actual drone flight plan. So I'm super excited for you to have these tools. So a few years ago, I went to South Australia, and I also went to Western Australia, but this picture uh, is from South Australia to assist on a research project where we were flying drones over southern right whales. So southern right whales are very large baleen whales. They eat in Antarctica, and they swim up to the coastline of South Australia, and while they're there, they are reproducing, they're giving birth to their calves, and so these moms are hanging out, not eating a single meal for like two to four months, and nursing this calf. So you can imagine, if you were nursing a calf and not eating for two months, you'd lose a lot of weight, right? So we're measuring with the drone the shrinkage of fat or blubber around that whale. We're also looking at does the calf grow long, does the calf grow fat during that time, and what's the average length and width and of that calf before she decides it's time to swim back to go get her first meal in a very, very long time. So there's a lot going on here, and these are <coughs> images that we couldn't have taken before unless we were flying with an airplane, but you can't really hover an airplane over a whale. So drones have been really helpful in this study. One of the cool things about being in South, South Australia, if you have not ever been there, um, is that it is the longest continuous um, 
cliff sides and like the whole entire world. You literally feel like you're on the edge of the world. These cliffs are very, very high and it's like miles. Like I think it's like eight miles of continuous cliff that are incredibly high. And as we're flying, these whales are down in inside of the head of the body um, in a large whale sanctuary. And we're standing up here, and you can see how tiny we are in our little research trucks. And this is the whole entire like Nullarbor, where it's Aboriginal land and some sand dunes. And so, as we're flying here, the whales obviously cannot see us. You can barely see us, right? So they don't really know we're there. And um, in this particular research, we're flying at 40 meters, so we're very high in the air, capturing these images. So. Drones do make a lot of noise, as you are all well aware, because they fly around us in our in our different environments, right? But here, the whales don't really hear it because we're flying so high above them. And we, after many flights of looking at, and this is also the height of the flight, looking out the other way. Um, so as we're as we're flying around, we're starting to look at behavior. So we're seeing, are we causing any disturbances to the whales? Are they reacting in a way that they normally wouldn't react? And how are they reacting or, and just behaving naturally? So we're watching these whales swim along here, along these coasts, and swimming back. And this is what they do all day with their calves, swimming and getting it stronger and nursing and rolling around. And one day we noticed that one of the moms had a ship strike one. And we were really concerned because we thought, oh wow, this is a whale sanctuary. We know the whales are here. And if she has a stri ship strike, we know that she must have taken that whale, the baby whale, out of this area um, and gone somewhere else to get this ship strike because there's no boats allowed in this area. And so we decided to fly the dro drone lower in altitude. As we did that, she actually dove down, changed course, and took her baby with her. And so, was that a disturbance? We believe it was because we never saw that happen before. So we think it was a disturbance, and it's something that you can document. So it's, when you have an encounter with wildlife, even if you're out hiking, not even with a drone, but you see a disturbance, a known disturbance, you can document that so you can share it with other people. So this is something that we can share. We did see what we think and what we believe is a disturbance. And so we flew up, we captured it, we found out that um, the wound was old and it was healing. So she most likely did not get the ship strike um, while she, she probably got it while she was pregnant and not necessarily at that point in time. So just to kind of go into a little bit of background of why I'm talking about whales at a bird conference. <laughs> I actually studied large whales. So the gray whales are similar to the right whales. They swim from um, Alaska all the way down the west coast to Mexico every year. And in fact, if you look out right now, you may see a gray whale, gray whale spout. And so they reproduce and give birth in Mexico and they eat in Alaska. So they're very similar in that. And I thought it was such an interesting migration. It's the gray whales have the longest migration of any um, baleen whale. And so I wanted to know what's happening with whale watching operations. How are they conducting sustainable operations? So I wanted to see how they use guidelines and regulations to go out on the boat and look at whales. So while I was at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, that was my research project. I went all the way from Canada, all the way from Mexico on 40 different vessels, or 40 different operations looking at how their vessels operate on the water. And to see, does, does what is offered to them right now as far as guidelines make sense and is that sustainable? So, as I was going along, I was using my background in project management. I was using this information that I was getting, gaining from my research, and I was going to Australia to fly under rigorous scientific permitting. And so, I was looking at all of these different components and how it was wrapping around and what I decided needed to happen because of all the drones that were being flown in California is that we needed some sort of guidelines, some sort of regulations to help us minimize disturbance to wildlife. And one of the things that I did see is every time I came back from Australia, there's lots of drones all over our coastline, flying everywhere, chasing pelicans, gulls attacking them, and all of these different things, 
kids, right? So I wanted to see how we can maybe start this conversation and go deeper. And some of the things that I've been able to do along the way because of this interest is help train researchers on how to fly drones and um, talk to other drone pilots. So I've done a lot of talks um, all over the world, all over the U.S., talking about drones and wildlife disturbance, and it's been a lot of fun. So what I like to do in my talks is actually talk about a drone. So who here is pretty well versed in drone? Okay, so we're going to talk about Drone 101. So a drone is anything that is 0.55 pounds to 55 pounds. So the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, says if you are going to purchase a drone or have a drone, it's going to be between this weight limit. And when you purchase your drone, you're going to pull it out of the box and it's going to tell you to register your drone and have all of these things. And you can weigh your drone and see how much it is. But the weight has to be within this, this range. If it goes over, it's a whole different designation. If it's below that, I mean, you're probably not going to fly it anywhere substantial except for your house because it's going to blow away. So, um, and when you think about this weight limit, one other thing that's very important is this is a weight limit for every contraption you add to that drone. So whether it's a life-saving buoy, a light, a camera, anything else, anything you add to it has to stay within this range. And then also just kind of talking a little bit more about the register of your drone. So the FAA requires everyone to register a drone. So you have to get a serial number, kind of like your license plate, that says, hey, I'm licensed to fly this drone. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So drones are more than just an experience. They're more than just a toy. So if you are in construction, you have a tool belt. You have a hammer. You have a shovel. You have some nails. You have all of these things, right? This drone is also a tool to help you move forward. And that's not how we market drones, right? Drones are marketed as toys for kids to play with. But are you going to give a kid a 55 pound flying toy? No. So it's really, if you think about drones, they are a tool, not a toy. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so. The Part 107, or the UAS, or Drone Regulations, um, just to clarify, I'm going to go back two steps as part of Drone 101. So drones can be called a drone, it can be called a UAS, so an unmanned aerial system, or UAV, which is an unmanned aerial vehicle. So there's a couple different things that you can use and acronyms for a drone, but a drone really, it, just for the sake of being easy, that's what this is. So UAS, or drone regulations, really came to be in 2016 um, in the US. So that's when the FAA said, hey, here's a set of guidelines, here's some rules for these drones. So before, they didn't even exist. And then once they made these rules, drones just sold like hotcakes everywhere. So part of the regulation was to kind of deviate from the, the, the model airplane type hobby pilot, so people who are not making any money, they're just going out and flying for fun, and then the people who are using drones for money. So whether you're getting paid to fly the drone, paid for any type of product, um, service or product that it comes from the drone, so if you are creating video or images or anything and you're going to sell those, like you have to get a Part 107 certification. So Part 107 is really tailored to a drone pilot. It's the certification. It's not a license. It's just a certification saying that you are well versed in the world of drone. Like you have taken the test and now you are certified to go make money with your drone. And this is very different from hobby. So if you decide to go fly a drone and not make any money using it, you can just go without ever having to take this test. So it's almost like giving a five-year-old the keys to a Mercedes and telling them to go drive on Interstate 5. You're like, go ahead, go ahead and take your drone out here and play around. 
Like, it's kind of insane to me that they are making everybody take this test to get a certification. But this is what the process is right now. So as I go through this, I just want you also to know I'm not a lawyer, and I'm definitely not an FAA regulator. So anything that, I'm a, that I do tell you today, please check back on it because one of the things that happened just while they were doing this is in one month, they said everyone must register their drone. The next week, oh, it's okay, no one has to register their drone. And then the next week later, they're like, everyone has to register their drone. So they don't know exactly how this is molding. And I mean, we're in 2020 now, so it's been four years. So things are getting more solid. And so most of the things I'm going to share with you today really are pretty solid and things that haven't changed over the last four years. So one of these things is being aware of airspace restrictions. So airspace starts from the ground, it goes up to about 60,000 feet. And there's all of these different classes. It kind of looks like an upside down um, wedding cake where you have, you know, you could have a specific airspace over an airport. And then it goes up and you can fly higher and higher around it. So there's restrictions around different areas that you have to be aware of. Here in San Diego, you can't fly a drone anywhere. And the reason is, is we have a lot of airports and heliports and military bases everywhere. And the rule is, is that you cannot fly, fly within five miles of any of these places. And they're so strategically located, obviously not for drone flights, but they're located in places that makes all of these things overlap. And so five miles, Five mile radiuses of these different airports and heli helipads and all of these different things makes it very difficult for a drone pilot to be flying. So almost anytime you ever see a drone flying in San Diego, it's probably illegal and um, unless they have a permit and have gone through the FAA to get that flight. Um, can you hold your question until the end? Um, okay, so as we look at airspace restrictions, it's super important to know before you go. So there is the Before You Fly app, and it's going to tell you what's happening. So let's say the president shows up to San Diego today. There's going to be some massive airspace restrictions, meaning everything is shut down. No airplanes in the air. That means no drones in the air as well. So knowing these before you go, having it at your hand while you're while you're at your spot. So let's say you get to your spot, you're ready to fly, check this out first so that you can make sure that you can actually launch your drone. Okay, so we're talking about airspace. So how high can you actually fly your drone? 400 feet. So if I am at the top of a 20-story building, how high above me do I have to fly? 400 feet. If I'm standing right here, or just out on this terrace, how high above me can I fly my drone? 400 feet. So this really is, no matter where you are, if you are on top of a mountain, on top of a building, at sea level, you have 400 feet from where you stand above your head to fly your drone, and that is your airspace. So you're not supposed to go higher, and you can go anywhere within that space to fly. Um, they have also some you can go 100 miles per hour with your drone or slower. And then if you decide you're going to fly around a home or any building, you have to have 400 feet between that space. So thinking about when you're planning your flight, if you're going to do some real estate or looking at um, any type of um, maybe a structure for a national park or well, maybe not a national park, but maybe an estuary or looking at different places, you have to stay um, 400 feet away. Another thing you have to really pay attention to is your visual line of sight. So with drones, they say you can fly out to three miles. I can't see anything three miles away. So they say, hey, there's a three mile radius around you. But really what we want you to do is have that drone a visual line of sight. So you need to know where your drone is at all times. Like Just like when you're driving, right? You need to know where your car is in relative to other cars around you. So you have to be able to see. So same thing with drones. You have to have that visual line of sight. You have to scan for any obstacles that might be in your way. And you're checking your battery life. You're checking operational safety and all these things at the same time when you're flying. 
Another important role that the FA has is that there's no operations over people. So they do not allow drones to be flied, flown over people. So if you're, if you're local to San Diego, you probably see drones flying over servers every day or at parks, at dog parks. That's actually illegal unless the people that, you, that, that are there at that, maybe it's a wedding or something like that, they go in there knowing that the drone is going to be there. So if you go to a marathon or you go to some sort of event, you're going to know that um, there could possibly be a drone there and then that is illegal. But if that's legal, but if you are flying a drone over people at any other time and they don't, they have not signed a waiver saying that you can do that, it's completely illegal. So how do you get through this? How do you manage flying your drone when there's people? How do you manage flying your drone when there's potential helicopters or birds or kites or monoplanes? You have a visual observer, so flying drones really is a buddy system. You should never fly your drone by yourself because one, you have to have visual line of sight. You need to see where your drone is, but you can't. If you see most drone pilots, they're like this, right? They're not, they're not looking up where their drone is. They're looking at whatever's capturing the photograph or the video. So they need somebody to be on the lookout to make sure that you're not gonna run into anything because, I mean, you don't want to run into like a aircraft with people in it because you could really hurt them, right? So bring your buddy. So going into what is out there. So if there's an airplane and you have your drone up, what are you going to do? You're going to get out of the way. That airplane has right away. If it's a helicopter, what are you going to do? You're going to get out of the way. If it's another drone, what are you going to do? <laughs> you're going to blow them up. Just kidding. No, you're not going to blow them up. You're going to get along and you're going to be the respectful one and you're going to have a good code of conduct and you're going to you're going to fly ethically. And you're going to just say, "Okay, go ahead." You know, I know other, that's not necessarily the rule of the road when we're driving on the interstate, but in the world of drones, just let that person go. Let them have the right of way and just, it's okay to back off. We're not in a race here. So no matter where you are, if it's a kite, if it's a bird, if it's a manned aerial vehicle, anything, just give it the right away and be really courteous. Because the more courteous you are, that's gonna kind of infiltrate through that whole entire industry. And we need a lot more of that in our world anyways. Okay, so when can you actually fly a drone? So you, 30 minutes, right before the sunrise is twilight, right? And then you have um, twilight on the other side, the last 30 minutes after the sun goes down. So in between that time, the sun is out all day long, you have the whole entire time to fly. If you wanna fly at night, if you don't have a permit to do so, it's illegal. If you do have a permit to fly at night, you're gonna say what types of lights you have, um, and that they comply for, with a, a certain standard so that other airplanes and other aircraft that might be in the air can see you. Um, and then you're going to have like a designated space and a reason for conducting that flight at night. So you're going to have a permit from the FAA that approves you to be at a specific location at a specific time in order to really fly at night. So hopefully... So, so I don't want you to leave thinking you can't fly it right, you can, but you just have to go through the proper um, protocol to do it. Okay, just like driving, drugs and alcohol, basically, don't do it. So if you had any drugs or alcohol, you have to wait the eight hour period, um, and you have to have certain, if you are flying with um, a specific, you know, alcohol blood, blood level, like you're going to probably go to jail if you hurt anybody. So these are these are really heavy, out of the box. These drones weigh, they can weigh up to like 20 pounds or so. Um, if you have smaller ones, they don't weigh as much, but still a few cause, they could go through a windshield, they could go through somebody's window. Um, if they drop out of the air, they can really hurt somebody. And then also, one of the things is, when you get out to this site, and you're about to launch your drone, 
one of the most important things is, am I going to disrespect anybody's privacy? Am I going to disrupt anything? Is this flight going to invade anybody's privacy? So just look around before you take off and think, what can I impact? What are the risks of this flight? And really think about how you can respect privacy to people because you want to be ethical, but you also want to be knowledgeable when you get out there. And so if you can think of any risks that might happen before you take off, this is the time to think about that risk and what you would do to mitigate it. Okay, so here are, uh, this is a good slide to take a picture of. So you have FAA drone zone, FAA.gov. So this is everything the feds want you to know about the certification process, about the rules, about the regs, everything about U.S. flying drones in the U.S. is right at this website. And then air map and dark drones and deploy, um, drone deploy, they are amazing tools and um, companies that are assisting with air, assisting, assisting, <laughs> yeah, with airspace regulations and helping you kind of know what's going on out there. And then if you want to do a 3D map or conduct some research, um, anything with GIS, um, all of these things. So these are three companies that are doing amazing things in the world of drones to really help pilots get the data, get information um, that they're looking for. So, the most important thing, like last year I got a call from this lady and she was excited. She's like, I'm going to Baja and I'm going to fly my drone over Wales down there and I'm going to capture all these images. Do you want them? And I'm like, whoa, wait a, wait a minute. <laughs> like, do you have a permit to do this? Are you doing it for scientific research? Have you talked to the researchers down there? I don't even know if this is legal. Hold on a minute. So um, we had to back up a little bit. I had to make a bunch of calls to see if it was even legal, and it's absolutely not legal for you to go bring your drone down to Baja and fly over the gray whales. So just so you know, if you're planning on packing your drone, if you want to come with me to Baja next year, don't pack your drone. <laughs> or you can, but we can't fly it at the lagoon. So knowing glo global drone guidelines and rules is really important. So there are other places around the world, like if you try to go to Cuba with a drone, forget it, they'll confiscate it. So like, there is a lot of different regulations, so just being really aware of what's happening before you go, because you don't want to lose this $1,200 drone you just invested in and all these amazing batteries and the cases and like all the cool things you get when you get a drone. So you don't want to lose that, it's expensive, so just know the countries you're going to before you go. So you might be asking, how come I haven't said really a whole lot about wildlife in this whole entire talk so far? Um, it's because the FAA does not, does not regulate wildlife. There's nothing that the FAA does that regulates wildlife. One, we don't want them to. Their mission is to keep the airspace safe for us. So when we get on an airplane, we get from point A to point B safely. And we want all of their attention on making sure we're safe up in the air. And so there's amazing organizations and agencies that really help wildlife. So whether it's a state agency or a federal agency or an NGO, there's lots of people working on wildlife issues. These are the agencies we need to address and say, hey, we need guides, guidelines for flying around wildlife that respect them. We need to, websites to go to to better understand how we can fly safely, respectfully around wildlife. And so it's really these agencies that manage, I don't necessarily like that word, that work with wildlife to protect them that we should be able to go to to actually get this information. But there's not tons of information out there right now besides going to the NOAA website and they basic, basically say don't do it at all. And that's not necessarily helping because people are flying. So if you are going to do it, how do you actually do it safely, right? So across the industry in the drone world, I have talked a lot of places uh, at a lot of different conferences and I've helped develop, um, there's a big airplane um, organization called AUVSI and they have started to take on drone certifications and education programs and so um, 
one of the things they wanted to do is help operators with education and um, knowledge about all things to the environment and our wildlife by taking a proactive stance because this technology is still fairly brand new. And I think if we have a little foresight, we don't have to come back and try to save everything because we were already flying ethically. So drones can be used for so many good things. And sorry, I feel a little sick after seeing this. So they can help with coastal erosion. They can help with our tides. They can help with, um, which is mitigating climate change impacts. So drones can really help us look at our coastlines in different ways. One of the projects that I'm working on is called Bisect. So what I want to see is I want to look at fragmentation of, of, of our urban areas and wild areas and capture this fragmentation and look and see, you know, where are hotspots for wildlife? Where are these corridors that they can move through? And when you look at, from a drone's perspective, you can actually see the cuts of golf courses and where humans are kind of cutting their way through the wild spaces. And fragmentation is one of the biggest issues for wildlife because they don't have these corridors to move through so there's not a lot of genetics because most animals don't fly. I mean lots of animals fly like birds but other animals terrestrial or swimming they can't really get through these places and so whether it's sonar which I can't do with a drone or fragmentation for terrestrial wildlife. Another good use of drones is whale entanglement. So a bunch of my friends at California Well Rescue use drones um, to go and disentangle whales and this has been a huge um, impact to whales that are swimming along the California coast. It used to be a handful of whales a year reported. It went up to double digits and then within the last five years there have been hundreds, over hundreds of whales entangled and reported in fishing gear and from the Dungeness of Crab Fishing um, industry and so basically these whales get the Dungeness crab gear which is a fixed gear um, it's a trap that the crabs go in it wraps around the whales in different ways and so what they have to do is take these small little boats and you can see here there's um, there's a, a knife at the end of that and you can cut the rope but if they leave any rope on the whale it will continue to stay entangled and then they probably will have another shot to actually get the whale disentangled. So with a drone you can kind of see how this wraps around the whale and they can go in and get that cut and make sure that they get it all off. And there's a lot less impact when you use drones. Um, you may know, know a little bit about noise pollution in the ocean and how that makes it a more stressful um, environment for the whales. Same thing here. You can back off once you have that drone footage. Um, you can go. You can back off with the boat, fly the drone, get the images that you need, and then go in and decide how you're going to make that cut. And so drones are really helping out in minimizing stress and disturbance to the animals that are impacted. Another really cool and positive thing that's happening in conservation is Hover UAV in Australia. It has a drone that has a life-saving buoy, it's deployable, that's attached to it, along with an AI system that looks for sharks. So in Australia, they have lots of diverse big sharks on their coastlines in like tiger sharks and white sharks and so what this AI system does is it can measure the shark, it can determine the species, they can start to look at the behavior of the shark if it's in a hunting mode or if it's kind of resting and then with the drone not only do they have this AI they have an alarm and so the drone pilot can just flip an alarm and the alarm goes off anybody who's in the water at that point in time can make a decision for themselves if they want to get out and also life the lifeguards, um, they call them lifesavers, they can um, go out with that drone and deploy that buoy if anybody's hurt or needs to be pulled in. Um, they can go out and save them, but they can also deploy that um, life-saving buoy. So there's lots of cool things that are happening with drones and Hover UAV is really at the forefront um, helping with our coastal um, rescue centers and stations. So now I've talked a lot about all the cool things that are happening with drones. There are some things we really need to be aware of, right?
So a couple years ago, some researchers flew a drone really close to some black bears, and what happened was the black bear sat there. When a black bear is disturbed, it swats, it charges, it gets up, it does a lot of different behaviors that indicate, I'm stressed, I don't like this. This black bear did nothing but they had put a heart monitor on this bear. And when they got the data back from that heart monitor, guess how high its heart rate went? 400%. It increased by 400%. Imagining our heart rate going up that high. We have a heart attack, right? <laughs> yeah, so just because an animal doesn't show a normal disturbance behavior doesn't mean that it's not disturbed. And it's really hard in large whales, especially, you can't just put that heart monitor on. And there's a lot of animals that we have a really hard time putting monitors on to determine is that physiological change actually occurring. So I'm gonna show um, a couple more disturbances, and it's gonna get pretty ugly, okay? I'm just gonna be very upfront. This is probably gonna bother you. It really bothers me. And YouTube may have an ad. I don't know what they're gonna do here. So here, this happened a couple years ago. You see this grizzly. walking across the steep cliff with her cub. And she's actively trying to get away from whatever's happening. She's running, right? She's moving, she's running. And if she's struggling, you know that little baby is having a hard time. Oh. So guess what is filming this right now? A drone. And instead of backing away and allowing them to have the time that they need, like I won't show anymore because it really bothers me, so it might bother you too, but you can go in and look at this video a little more. It's really something that makes you curious, but this happens multiple times and it's just really sad. So, um, so when we're flying drones, there can be a lot of impact, things that we might not see. And then we might be looking at something like this while it's going on and not even realizing that this is a disturbance. So the person who's behind this drone might not actually realize he's causing a disturbance because he may not know what the behavior is of a bear. And so you can't, we can get really ticked off, right? Like this makes us so mad, what are you thinking? But really the person who's operating them may not even realize that they were causing this big of a problem. Eventually the drone moves away and the bear gets up. But um, also I wanna share a little bit about, I had shown the moving art a little bit before we got in here. So when we're using drones out in wildlife, we need to actually think about how we're using them. And so in this, um, in this part here, you know, it's beautiful and we love it and it's, you know, highly engaging. But there's also aspects of this video that are using drones. You know, absolutely wonderful and beautiful that they can show the movement of our world in a way that really inspires us. But there's also a responsibility of whether you're creating research or creating something beautiful that really we need to address when we're using drones. And as we go through this, so you can tell this was done with a drone. There's no animals, so we're not really impacting anything here. This was used with a drone. But you can see here, this is also a drone, right? Over zebras running. And then, um, I'm gonna keep going a little bit to the next one. Um, okay, I guess we know what's gonna happen here. 
Maybe. Question, did the cub ever get back up to the top of the ridge where the mom was? Yeah. It did. Maybe this will bite. Yeah, it did, but we don't know what the impact is long term, you know?
trying to figure out what are things that our people are doing out there with mostly marine wildlife, whether it's manned aerial or drones, and how are they flying, and what, are they, what kind of things are they putting inside of their permits to be responsible and ethical. So I came up with a six-step program called STRIVE. And the first letter is S, and that's scope and seek. So I'm gonna bring you back to my project management roots a little bit, I'm talking about scopes and seeking out people. So developing that scope of work, what is your flight plan going to include? And who do you need to talk to? So this is one, knowing the animal's behavior. Who studies this animal? Where does this animal live? How might I impact, impact it seasonally? We know that birds come here for wintering, right? So what are they doing here? Are they nesting? Um, have their chicks hatched? Um, and especially with seagulls, are going to be very aggressive during um, nesting season. And so just knowing kind of what's happening with, those, with, that, with the animals. And then T is your toolbox. So um, the Strive program is really set up to help you get your toolbox set up. How do you have the right permits? Um, do you have all of your equipment? Have you, if you are working with a set, a customer if on a drone flight or within a research project or getting a video, have you tested all of your equipment? I've been on site with people who didn't test their equipment before they showed up and guess what? It didn't work. And so we were supposed to be out there for five days getting estuary information and collecting data, but we showed up with tools that didn't work. So um, having your toolbox ready and is really important before you ever get out to the field. Okay, R is for review. You want to review everything you're going to do in your flight plan with everyone who's a part of your operation so that everyone knows exactly what is going to happen. So maybe one of your mitigations of risk if you encounter an osprey might be to fly higher than the osprey. Because if you go up above the birds, they're typically less, they don't feel like well, how they feel, but they're less likely to um, have a behavior that's going to attack your drone. <laughs> so literally knowing what the disturbance behavior is, getting that, having a visual observer looking for that and flying above, or if you know that there's any nests. So when we were in South Australia, there's a lot of falcons that um, <coughs> nest on those rocky cliffs. So we had to know exactly where those nests were and we weren't allowed to fly in specific areas along those cliffs as we move from different stations along there because of nesting birds. So really knowing where those birds are at and how to mitigate those risks. And then I is for information. So really um, flying as informed as possible. So do you have everything ready to go? So you are in your in-flight operations, you are flying, you have your permits, you know exactly everything that you're going to do and you are in operations. And this is where you're putting all of those tools into place. B is your visual observer. They're helping look at, look at everything. You might recognize this area. It's Tourmaline Beach and Law Street Park here in San Diego. And I captured this 3D image with um, the Drone Deploy software, just if you're interested in mapping software. Um, so yeah, your visual observer helps you really look for seagulls and other um, things that fly around, especially in this area, a lot of low-flying helicopters and airplanes and military um, vehicles flying around. So lots of birds, lots of traffic. And then E is for education. So as I mentioned before, when we were talking about this disturbance with the right whale and she swam under, and I thought that's the only one that we had seen that whole entire trip, documenting that in your logbook. So when you become a Part 107 certified drone pilot, they also encourage you to keep a logbook about every flight that you do. So inside your flight book, you're gonna log any type of encounters that you might have that were negative or positive. So did you do something that actually worked? Were you able to fly around some nests without disturbing the animals? Like what altitude were you at? Um, what time of day? And any other type of tools that you might have used. So when we do these 
six steps and we implement them into our flight plan, we're really flying in a way that's ethical. We're really setting that code of conduct, that gold standard, and we're showing how other pilots can follow along in this way. So really you're an ambassador for drone flights. And not only, let's say you don't want to fly at all, at least you have some tools that you can talk to them about if you do encounter a drone pilot doing something that might be disturbing an animal. You can say, hey, why, why don't you go around this way? Why don't you, you know, this bird is nesting right now. It would be better if you flew from over there where there's no nests or anything that you might be helpful in a positive way. So one thing I do want to talk about that I feel is very important when it comes to the drone industry is there are very large companies like Amazon, and we get everything delivered from Amazon, right? We don't even have to go to big box stores anymore because we can get everything from Amazon. So what Amazon is proposing are these gigantic drone hives. So think of a beehive on steroids full of drones. And what these drones are going to do is deliver our burritos, deliver our shoes, deliver our cold binoculars, whatever it is. But when you think about airspace, we don't really have a lot of manned airplanes in the same airspace as our birds, or not very often, right? So airplanes typically fly quite a bit higher than birds. So we do have impacts on landing and takeoff and that sort of thing, or flyovers. But drones are in the space that birds are living. Birds are living in the space where drones are going to be flying. So when we think about hummingbirds, think about our songbirds, they're nesting, they're eating, they're resting, they're raising chicks. Everything that they're doing is in that same airspace that drones are going to be. So think about that noise that drives us insane. In fact, humans would rather listen to a dump truck than drone noise. We did a study on that. Crazy, right? So. If we think about what's happening with our animals and our, especially birds in this space, we have huge impacts that are not being addressed, they're not being looked at. So if a drone hive is being proposed in your city, protest. Like, it's terrible. We need to really figure this out way before. We have an opportunity now before we completely fill up our airways with the drones. That's what I'm saying. This is a tool, not a toy. If you want to do research, great. It's minimized. But this is a daily thing that could happen along our, in our changing our entire cityscape and cha changing the whole entire noisescape with these flying drones. So something we really need to think about. There's also another thing about drones. When I talked about the hearts, the bear's heart rate going up, over time the bear is going to habituate. So that means the heart rate will go down and the drone will fly. And they'll become habituated. A lot of the sea lions in La Jolla are becoming habituated to the amount of foot traffic that is in their habitat. They've been pushed off to these cliffs that barely have a little bit of habitat left, but really they're habituating to having to live a life among lots and lots of people. The same thing could happen with birds. They could habituate or they could, you know, disappear. So we have a lot to think about when it comes to flying drones. Just because we can't habituate an animal, potentially, should we? So really thinking about what your question is, thinking about what product, what video, what photograph, what research you want to do, answering that question, thinking about that, and then thinking, is the drone the best tool for this? And if it is, then go use it. Collect the data, share it with us, because what you find is going to be amazing. We've seen blue whales foraging in ways that we've never seen them forage before. We've captured all kinds of data from drones that has changed the way we see the world. So really when you think about it, there are lots of great ways. I didn't realize I was going to talk this long ago. Sorry. Okay, so... Um, one other really cool thing about drones, and I want to leave you with a good story, and also some, some calls to action. So, the vaquita is the smallest marine mammal in the world. It lives here in the Sea of Cortez. Um, when I started at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in 2014, we thought there was about 70 of them left. 
Now, today, in 2020, they think there is like seven of them left. What's happening is they get caught up in the fishing gear for totuaba. Totuaba are also an endangered fish. The Chinese want that bladder, and they pay around $18,000 an ounce for a totuaba bladder, and it is called the cocaine of the sea. And so these little vaquitas, they only live in this area. They're, very, they're endemic to this area, and one of the things they you know, they tried to do a sea pen, it didn't work. Um, they're very, very anxious animals, um, and they die of heart attack very easily. And um, that's why when they get caught up in these nets, like they die very quickly. But um, going back to drones here, they use drones to help find illegal fishermen, and drones have been shot out of the sky. Like everything about this, there's a lot of poaching. There's a lot of stuff going on, but drones are a great tool to help us find poaching, um, illegal fishing, and especially like you think about elephants and rhinos and gorillas, drones are really helping in areas where poaching and wildlife trafficking are happening. So some things you can do today, take your Part 107 certification course, register your drone, ask for help, go out and seek it. Learn about the animals in your area and the people and just about the area you want to fly in. Get as much knowledge about animal behavior. Determine if your flights or data are going to contribute to science or something better beyond what you're doing. Um, download the apps, educate others, and create a flight plan. So really think about what you're going to do before you go out there. I put together a Stripe course. If you want to take a picture of that slide, it's at alamosphere.thinkific.com and it really walks you through each part of those steps and gives you some um, flight plan worksheets so that you can really think about developing your flight. And then I put together a book with the 100 lessons for making your flight safe at the Colm Green. You can flip through it, it's a good field guide. And I'd love for you to listen to my podcast and subscribe. <laughs> so I talk to leaders from around the world who are successfully doing wildlife projects. Jennifer Lee Warner in the back here, who is an amazing wildlife photographer. She's also on the podcast. So lots of amazing people who will inspire you to get outside and take some action for wildlife. And Jen and I are going into the field. We have a lot of cool things. Um, there's some brochures on uh, Mexico and Costa Rica. We're going to be in La Jolla next month doing a photography and ecology tour. So if you're interested in taking photos, it would be great for you to join. And we have some other fun trips going to Galapagos in Alaska. You can ask us about that. And yeah. Join me, connect with me on Facebook or Instagram, and I don't know if I have time for questions. I have time for your question. <laughs> well, strange, but um, so can you do this type of thing um, with a drone that weighs less than 0.55 pounds, or is it just too, probably too small to really do too much? Yeah, it's just, I mean, if you, yeah, they're just too small. The way, like, you have to really think about the wind because it's going to blow. There's not a lot of stabilization on those really tiny drones. So, yeah. And there, is this being enforced? These these rules? I mean, do people actually get in trouble for flying drones without you know having the certification? We don't get in trouble for flying without a certification yeah. unless you're making money. So if you know somebody who's making money off their drones, you can report them to the FAA, and they will take note of it. So you said that you, um, no matter where you're standing, that you um, could go 400 feet in the air. If you're in an elevated position, say you're like on a cliff, is there a regulation on how low you can fly? Like, can you fly below where you're standing, and is there any regulations for that? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you think about it, once you, so the drone is going to measure where you're at right here. Like, and, going up. So it's not going to measure negative um, altitude. So you're just going to have to make sure if you are on a cliff that once you go over the cliff, you're still going to have to comply that that's 400 feet above wherever the drone is. So, but the registration of the drone is going to be where you're standing, which is can get a little confusing, but just kind of keeping in mind that you need to have that 400 feet. And I mean, if it's like literally like thousands of feet down or something, then 
I would, you're probably somewhere deep in nature, and I would say, just use the 400 feet above you. I mean, there's some of these are like practical tips, you know. It's a good question, though. Yeah. Okay, so which federal aid, or man, um, I have to think of another question. Okay. Um, what is a good question I could ask? Okay, I'm just going to say, what is one thing that you learned from today? Anybody willing to share? Respect. <laughs> yeah, how do you do it? Stop Amazon. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I missed this, um, but like, so you know, you have your six steps that you go through. Um, but I mean, there's just like a, a measurement of feet or yards that you should just stay away from any wild animal. Like, what would that be? Because the thing is, you know, obviously there's you know, a bear in the middle of the field, like, I'm not going to fly the drone right over it. But, like, if I'm flying a drone over a forest, and it's like, you know, like, 50 feet above the trees, or even like 100 feet above the trees, how do I know that there's not an owl tucked in, you know, on the branch somewhere in the forest? And, I mean, I've just thought about this so much, I've, I mean, you, this is obviously, you're an expert, uh, you, read over 1,100 papers on this subject. I, I read that paper about the bears, um, and I read, also read a bunch of articles in the media, like the National Geographic with other scientists talking about it. They said, just because a bear's heart rate increases a lot, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's super bad for the animal. That's what some scientists said in National Geographic. Maybe he's completely wrong. But I guess, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but it's, I just feel like the only way to be completely sure that I don't impact any wildlife in a really bad way is to not fly my drone at all. So I guess that's why I'm kind of looking for a distance. I, I did read one paper that they give, they did give specific distances. I can't remember what they were, but uh, in your opinion, what would be a good distance? Yeah, that's why you need to really scope out the area that you're going to fly in. It's if you have an opportunity to do some groundwork before you ever get the drone up in the air and really talk to the national park people, state park people, wherever. If you're going to fly in, if you have permits to fly in those areas, um, really know what wildlife you can encounter. So what, what species are there? What are they doing? And where do they live? and what should you be aware of. And that's the problem with drones is that there's, and that's a problem of flying around wildlife and even wanting to capture images because there's not a distance that you can say is safe because like Katie Sweeney, she works for NOAA and she is a drone pilot that, that does a lot of work with the seals um, and stellar sea lions on the Andalusian Islands, like the very, very remote ones off of Alaska. So there's part of like the stellar sea lion population that's going completely extinct while the other part is perfectly fine and they have fur seals and all kinds of other things going on. But she flies over these populations to look at them. and. And I was talking to her specifically about this because I'm looking here and seeing drone flights over the harbor seals and sea lions and looking at um, flushing and how the sensitivity. And she's like, on days where the wind, if the wind is blow, so where some of these animals live, they go up into um, a beach and along that beach is a giant cliff. So if the wind is blowing across the cliff out to the ocean, sound is moving this way. If the wind changes any bit, or it's a cloudy day, or something happens, if you fly that drone, all those animals flush, because that they can hear the noise. So it's it's understanding that behavior, and so, like, so there's not a good distance that you can really say, don't, don't fly 500 yards, or don't fly 50 feet. Like yeah. You can't have, you really have to know that behavior and what's happening in that season. Okay, I mean, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, so I, I guess just, 
And if there's a species of animal that could be in a concealed location that you don't know, but there's no literature data at all out there that shows that there's any impact on of drones on them, I mean, what would you say in that situation? Like, for example, with an owl in a tree, you know? Yeah, I think that if there's not any, because drones are so new, there's lots of species out there that we don't have this information on, in fact. So if you are one of those people who are going out to the field and you, this is one thing that you might encounter, just feel like it's your responsibility to document any disturbances that might happen. You're not going out there to cause a disturbance. I mean, that's not where your heart is. That's not where your flight plan is. Like, nothing is going out there to do that. But it could happen. And we don't know what the disturbance reaction will look like. We don't know what it's going to be. So document everything you learn so that you can share it with people. Because that we just don't know yet. We don't know what we don't know. And so it's really, when you think about, I want to work with wildlife, I want to fly drones. You might be the first person to be in that area. So what is that? And another thing to think about, they flew drones over the Marlboro Murelands. You have to have that old growth forest in order to reproduce. And so there's not a lot of old growth forest left along the West Coast. And so these populations are, you know, very, um, very small and um, very sensitive to all kinds of things. And so when they, they used drones and infrared light to kind of figure out where they were, but they had to be very careful about hovering for too long because crows um, and other birds of prey, I can't even remember, but they see that and that becomes an indicator for them to find their prey. So you also have to think, if I do this thing, and I find this thing, if I'm going to be hovering in place, is there a potential that, you know, I mean, gulls and ravens and crows and birds of prey, hawks, I mean, they're all incredibly smart animals. So if they see you hovering, that means you found something and it could be food. So just thinking about those aspects are really important too. Yeah. Um, there was a picture of uh, a peregrine falcon attacking or about to attack um, a drone over the Salton Sea. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me what happened? Yeah, I actually can't tell you what happened because I didn't take that picture. My friend Shane Kina took that picture and he was really excited to have a couple pictures of drones and wildlife. He's, yeah, so anyways, I'm promoting his picture and he was out there and I don't really know what happened. We'd have to ask Shane, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'd love to know which, who won. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know, right? Yeah. I've seen at least one video on YouTube of a red tailed hawk attacking a drone just because it thought it was another bird yeah. and it did not want it around. It was just upset. Just yeah. upset over the fact that it was hovering about. Mm -hmm. It just preferred not to have the company. Did it destroy the drone? Um, I can't remember. I, I think I think the drone got thrown to the ground. Yeah. So, profoundly, we could say, yeah, the drone was destroyed. Of the mark, very crash-worthy yeah. drones. So, what's the speed limit on a drone? Hundred miles an hour. Yeah, good job. <laughs> kids probably 12 or older. Um, I've been on a tour um, when I was doing my research where um, I went with a group down to Baja on one of my trips.
trips down there, and a nine-year-old girl came with her grandma, and we had the best time. And I actually ended up making a video about one of the guidelines for whale watching, and she's the voice of my video. So I think having kids come along is the most important thing, and if people are wanting to come as a family, I 100% would love that. So.